Hi everyone, Jamie Humphreys here for Six String Alliance and today's quick riff, we are taking a look at River of Love by Lynch Mob. So today I thought we'd take a look at a quick riff. I haven't done a lesson for a while. I've been doing lots of gear demos recently and I've wanted to look at some George Lynch for quite a while as he's one of my favourite guitar players. Now Lynch Mob was put together by ex docken guitar player George Lynch and they released their debut album Wicked Sensation in 1990 and River of Love is the second track from this album. Now this was an absolutely fantastic album. I bought this when it first came out. I even used to buy this uh, this uh, VHS video called Hot Guitarist Magazine. This was long before the internet when you had to uh, you know send off for uh, for videos of guitar content and there was one particular issue came that had all these outtakes of George Lynch in the studio jamming and cutting solos to various tracks from that album. Now this was a big sounding album. There's some fantastic tracks on there, some really well written tracks and I think some of George's finest guitar playing but like many bands from this era the popularity of the band was short-lived due to changes in popularity of musical styles during the early 90s. Now crazily enough last year Wicked Sensation celebrated its 30th anniversary and also George released a new version of the album Wicked Sensation Reimagined that saw re-recordings, new versions of the songs, slight different feels, different styles and new interpretations of the tracks. Now George Lynch is without a doubt one of the greats to emerge from the 1980s. At one point he was even considered to be the new guitar player for Ozzy Osbourne and obviously he found fame playing in Dokken before moving on to working with his own projects such as Lynch Mob. More recently he's been working with Doug Pinnock with the KXM uh, a project. It's got uh, uh, Ray Luzier, I think his name is the drummer from Korn as well. So George is an incredibly active and influential guitar player. Now George is a very unique guitar player when it comes to his lead style. He's one of those instantly recognisable guitar players. He utilises a lot of wide stretches, making use of quite exotic sounding intervals as well as some unorthodox scales. Another thing about George Lynch is his guitar sound. The sound on this album is outrageously good and during this time he was using Soldano amps and also modified vintage Marshalls and when it came to guitars although he used a lot of different instruments, a lot of different guitars, he's got, got quite a, an expansive guitar collection, it was primarily 
ESP guitars. And also, I believe he was using some Paul Reed Smiths. I've seen footage of him and also read about him using a pair of Paul Reed Smiths during this period. So let's just talk very quickly about how I achieved the tone today. I was quite pleased with the tone on this one. I thought it came out quite good. I had to play a guitar with a hockey stick headstock. So I'm using my Kramer 84. I actually believe that uh, um, ESP used to make the necks for Kramers back in the early 80s or, or they came out of the same factory. So single pickup on this. This is a Seymour Duncan JB. Now I'm plugged into my Mesa Badlander, which is a phenomenal amplifier. And although it's got its own onboard cab clone IR, which I use a hell of a lot, it's got its own uh, built-in load box. So you can just plug straight into your audio interface and utilize the onboard IRs. It's got some beautiful captures of Mesa cabs as well well as the uh, the capability of you being able to load your own IRs. But I wanted to use the two notes dynamic IRs today, they're Dyn IRs, and use the George Lynch signature pack. So I'm using Capta, just the regular Capta, and I'm coming from that into the Mac, into my audio interface, and I'm using Wall of Sound, which is the two notes plug-in, they're, they're uh, kind of um, uh, impulse resp uh, response loading suite, if you like, and I'm running the uh, the George Inch pack, and I'm using the VH1 and the VH2 cabs. Now, I'm also using a TC electronic spatial expander, adding that post-production to the double track guitars. I really love that plugin. It helps with the width, adds a little bit of that sort of delay uh, modulation effect and just makes everything sound a little bit wider. I use that uh, that plugin a lot. I'm also using a Neve channel strip and um, I've boosted the high end slightly. I've added around about 8K just to give a little bit of that sizzle to the guitar tone and I've cut around 350 to 400, just very slightly, just to make the guitar sit a little bit better. And I've also rolled off a little bit of low end as well. So just cut the low end slightly so that uh, the low end doesn't become boomy and muddy. On top of that, for the rhythm guitar sound, I'm using the Ocean Way reverb. So it's literally like putting the guitar amp in the Ocean Way studio. And there's a little bit of delay courtesy of the TC Electronics 2290. Now for the lead guitar tone, it's pretty much the same. The EQ is slightly different and I'm also using a little bit more gain as well. Now also on the original recording, I always noticed on the intro, there's like this kind of sparkly, clean sounding guitar that double tracks. I always thought that was an acoustic guitar, but on closer inspection, it just sounds like a clean guitar, a clean single coil guitar. So what I did was on the backing track, I've just double tracked that using Amplitude 5. And I, I used a sound that was a mixture of a, a sort of slightly compressed and pushed Vox modeled amp. And also I split the signal and used a clean DI. And I just sat that low behind the distorted guitars and it just added a little bit more um, uh, definition and dynamic to the picked notes of the chord. I should also point out as well on the lead guitar, I'm using a different reverb. I'm using the Lexicon plugin. All of the uh, uh, things like the, the Ocean Way Studio and the Lexicon and the Neve stuff is all on my UAD. Okay, so let's get into the lesson now. Let's start taking a look at the parts. I've broken this down into two sections. We're going to look at the rhythm guitar parts first and then some of the lead guitar parts as there's a lead part which is featured quite heavily throughout this track. Now, as ever, you can download the tab and the guitar profile, but I'm also giving you the backing track that I played along to during the intro. I'm giving you two versions of that. One version is going to have a little bit of the rhythm guitar on one side, plus that sort of clean overdub guitar, just to give you something to play to, add a little bit more weight when you're jamming along. And also where if you choose to jump to the lead parts, there's a little bit of supporting rhythm guitar. But I've also included a version of the backing track with absolutely no guitars on so if you want to experiment record your own version make your own video using the track then you have a nice clean template to record to so let's kick things off by taking a look at the rhythm guitar part first we're going to look at the introduction riff and this is also the same as the chorus riff it's based around the chords of d5 
C sus 2, G over B, G5, and then we have this F, F sus 2 chord. And what you're doing is you're playing some chord arpeggio. So the first chord, you, you start off by playing the D string and the second fret G, and then you pick the B string. So you get this. Then you're going to play the C root note in the open G. Then you're going to drop down to the B note. So you get this. You're obviously putting the open G in there. Okay, then we're playing the third fret E and the open G. So one more time slowly. Then we play the F5 chord. And then we pick that open G. So put that together. So the second time, instead of playing the F5 chord or that F sus 2 chord, we have this little figure. Open A, hammer on to third fret A. Then open D, hammer on to second fret D. Then we go round again. And then we just play a D5, a, the uh, C sus 2, and a G5. You know, it's really nice holding that shape when you play that C sus 2 to G5. I'm not playing the top E. You can play the top E if you like. I'm literally just holding the B string and I'm dropping my second finger down. So when I'm playing the C sus 2, I'm muting out the A string so there's no third. And I do the same when I play the G5. I just drop my second finger down onto the third fret E and I mute the A string out. Now, something to bear in mind here, when you watch George Lynch play this live, he doesn't really play it the same as he plays it on the original recording. Um, and also in later videos, he's... He's kind of all over the place a little bit, I must admit. He's playing lots of different licks and uh, chord fills. There's a, a, a couple of early videos that were in one particular MTV. I think it's an MTV performance that uh, that he's playing on. And uh, you can clearly see him the, playing the rhythm part and holding these chord shapes, but he doesn't play the, uh, the little lead melody at the front end. So... Uh, Please bear in mind, this is my interpretation. Also, the guitars are really layered up, so it is a little bit tricky to hear absolutely everything. So what I'm going to do now is just play through that intro part nice and slowly. Here we go. So now we're on to the verse progression. This is quite straightforward, based around these chords. Really tight rhythm part, playing the D5 to the C, uh, the G over B, sorry, to the C sus2. And that last chord, you do a, uh, another down up strum at the end. And there's little mutes in between as well, just helping with the rhythm. Okay. Then we have that little fill there. So it's open A to third fret A to the third fret of the D. So put that together. Okay, then we go around again. Okay, slightly different fill that time. So it's open A to third, open D to third. Okay, then we start the progression again. This time we have a slightly different fill, which goes. So that's open A to third fret A. 
third fret D, and then back to the third fret A. So, uh, then we go around the chords again. And the final time we play an open low E to the F5 chord. And then we play that open G string. So now let's put that section together nice and slowly. Okay, now let's take a look at the pre-chorus. We start off with a G5. And then we drop down, which is like a, um, I guess it's like an F chord, uh, the top part of an F chord with a G in the bass. So it's kind of outlining a G mixolydian tonality. You're just playing the top two strings at the first fret and then playing the third fret of the low E. And again, watching George play this live, this is the fingering he uses. See him swapping his hand and doing that stretch. And then we do that, that, uh, that G, that F chord, if you like, with the G in the bass again. And they're here, we're kind of playing a C chord. We're playing the uh, top three strings, open G, first fret B and open top E, but still with that, um, uh, uh, that G in the bass. Also, there's an open D, so you get this. Then we have a little rundown. Three to two on the A string. Then we do the chords again. Then we have a, a, a climbing figure. Let's open E to this first fret and the second fret. Then we do the chord figure again. And then a little run down. And then this time we have a slightly different ending. It's uh, the same chords, but just played slightly different. So uh, yeah, there's a bunch of open strings at the end of that. So you play the G5, the F over G, the F over G again, then to the C over G, kind of C over G. It's got an open D in it, but we'll ignore that. And then you play the open top three strings. It's got, but it's definitely got an open B and an open E in there. I don't know whether he intended to play that or when it's just when he's moving his hand to get to the next chord. So now let's play through the pre-chorus section slowly. Here we go. Okay, and then we're into the chorus, and the chorus is the same as the introduction. And I just added a D chord on the end there just to kind of bookend our slightly abbreviated example. So now let's move on to the first lead part. This is the melody line that we hear repeating throughout the track. This is the part that George sometimes plays, sometimes doesn't play. And this part is open to debate, I think. Uh, I've seen some people playing it on the G and the B string. And at first I did before years ago play it that way, but it, to me, it never sounded quite right. 
And then um, I know that that's how it's written in the tab book, the official tab book. But then after watching some videos of George playing it, although he doesn't play it the way it's played on the original, he is playing it in this position. So I've gone with my gut feeling that the riff is played on the D and the G strings as opposed to the G and the B string. I think it's got a little bit more weight to the palm muted notes that you hear on the D string. To me, it makes a little bit more sense. So we kick things off by playing a muted D string at the 12th fret, pulling off 12 to 11 on the G. Then we slide 12 down to 10 on the D. It's definitely a slide. And then we play the 9 on the G, back to the 10 on the D, and then we play the 12 on the G, so put that together. And then we play the 10 on the D again, and then the 11 on the G, so let's play that slowly. And then we change positions and we play seven on the G and eight on the D. Ten on the G, back to eight on the D. And then we play nine. And we slide up to ten on the G string. So put that together. And I would do that all with downstrokes as well. It's got that kind of choppy feel. And pay attention to the muted notes on the D string. I think that's really important for the dynamic of the riff. So let's play that again. And we finish off there with this little figure, 754 on the G string. Lots of uh, wide vibrato on that final note. On to the next guitar fill. Now, this occurs during the second half of the verse. And this is very much based around D minor. Uh, and it's using D minor pentatonic. So you're just sliding down seven to five. Play seven on the D, and then five on the G. And then we have this little descending figure. So that's five on the G to seven on the D. Five on the G to five on the D. Now we have a real Dorian sound here. You're playing that B note on the G string to the F note on the D string, so... And then we finish off with a D minor triad. So that's two on the G, three on the D, and five on the A string. So put that together. Once again, using downstrokes, lots of palm muting there on the lower string. Okay, next up, we have this tapping lick. This is a really cool little lick, this. I love this lick. So we've got this hammer on and pull off between six and eight on the uh, B string, and then we're just tapping down. So you get... So the notes that you're tapping are on the 18th fret, 17th fret, and then the 13th and the 12th. And you put that together with that little trill. And at the end there, we just have... And he re-strikes that final note. Sorry, I, I hammered it a moment ago. So one more time. Bring it up to speed a little bit more. It's a really cool little uh, little tapping figure, that. Okay, then we have this lick that sees us leaving the pre-chorus section. We're just sliding. 
sliding from the 19th fret up to the 20th fret of the B string. And then play the 17th fret to the 20th fret of the top E. And then bend the top E at the 20th upper whole tone. Again, this is just a, uh, a really small little guitar overdub that leads us into the chorus. Okay, now we're into the chorus section. And again, we're kind of repeating that figure that we've heard. Um, apart from it, it's not playing throughout. You'll have the first part of the chords. And then the second time round, we have our... Then back to the chord. And then we have this little figure to finish off. So there you're pulling off 10 to 9 on the G. And playing 10 on the D. And then you're doing the same figure, but just dropping it down 5 to 4 on the G string and 5 on the D string. We re-strike the D string. Play 3. And then resolve to five on the A. Now again, you could play that, but to me, it, I don't know, it kind of sounds right playing. I know you've got a jump position. But once again, you know, this is my interpretation. Who am I to say that this is the correct way? It's up to you to experiment, but for me, that kind of feels right and that kind of sounds right. Okay, so there you have it. Those are the parts for our quick riff today. Quite a tricky one, this, uh, especially when you try and put the uh, the different parts together. But uh, as always, practice nice and slowly. You've got the tab there and the guitar profile, and also you have two backing tracks. Not one, but two backing tracks. So have a go. I'd love to see what you guys come up with, see if you can... Uh, you know, experiment a little bit with some double tracking and layering of the guitars. I always pan, obviously, the guitars, but there's a, the part that you see me record is obviously when I'm performing, I'm recording a part then. I always play live in my videos, but then afterwards, uh, when I'm mixing, I will then double track that part. So I play along with myself and then I normally pan them not quite hard left and hard right. I think on my, on Cubase, I've got them panned sort of around about 85 to the right and 85 to the left. And then I'm putting on the spatial expander as well, which is just uh, adding a little bit more width and a little bit of that sort of pitch modulation. But um, yeah, you know, maybe you find some of this stuff helpful. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun to get into layering parts and, uh, you know, especially when, you, when, you, when you're filming yourself and then you, you get to do a little bit of post-production. It, uh, it's, it's, it's good fun. I love it. Okay, so anyway, that's it for me. Really hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Follow the link in the description to download the tab and the backing tracks, and I'll see you here very soon for more lessons. And if you don't already, please subscribe. Thank you very much. Bye for now.